Looks like it's recording. Is it? Uh, it says oh, recording. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Now it's recording on my end. All right. Okay. All right. Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to patreon.com slash Aksum. You can also join the YouTube channel directly at multiple levels. Today's guest is Jonathan Pajot. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's good to it's good to talk to you again. Yeah, it's good to talk to you as well, turning the tables a little bit. Um, I, I want to start off with, I think most people in my audience will already know who you are, but they're bound to be new people. Could you talk about how you either first heard of and or got into the Orthodox Church in terms of uh, are you a cradle or a convert? So I grew up in a, I grew up evangelical which in a strange world because I grew up in French speaking Canada, Quebec. So it used to be the most Catholic place in the world, you know, before the 60s, basically. And so in the 60s and 70s, a lot of people, let's say, left the Catholic Church. And my parents left the Catholic Church and became evangelical in a move that was really a desire for sincerity, like a desire to find something more connected to their experience and more. Uh, they felt like the Catholicism that they lived in was was stale and not only stale, but was just, you know, they didn't really people didn't understand it very well. So they, they became evangelical. My father was a Baptist pastor actually when wow. I was young. And then myself in my own, in my twenties, I began to have questions and I began to read and to look into um, philosophy and different traditions, you know, even other religions. And ultimately also in a quest through art because I was uh, studying painting in, in school. And I was struggling to, let's say, join everything together. You know, my, let's say, my Protestant faith, uh, contemporary art, and then myself as a Christian artist, all of it just wasn't coming together. So all of that, it also, in let's say, in a general spiritual search, led me to discover, first of all, medieval art, and then ultimately Orthodox art, and finally, really, just the theology of the Orthodox Church. And it's it's mysticism and it's deeply connected web of beautiful uh, stories and imagery and hymns. And so I, so yeah, so that's what led me to orthodoxy. I converted in 2003, which is, yeah, it's just going to be close to, uh, to 20 years now. That's, that's amazing. Um, and I do have more questions about that, but actually the art piece that you said is so fascinating. And I think it's what sets you apart as a kind of public thinker or intellectual other than, uh, others, a lot of the converts, even from evangelicalism that we come across, they are wooed by the smells and bells, kind of like those first Russians who converted. But I think very few do it from the particular art and aesthetics point of view that that you did in the art history. And I, I used to study the philosophy of art. I have friends who are art historians as well. So that's fascinating to me with you as a practitioner. Could you talk about that? Because I know you as a, a carver, but you also talked about painting. Could you talk about your background in, in those two and, I don't know, similarities and differences? Yeah, I studied painting in school. I thought I was going to be a painter, <clears throat> and I, I really like to draw. And so it's really, it's a, it's almost like all of it just happened in a very strange way. Because when I started to look into orthodoxy, I really wanted to be an icon painter. I guess it's just the you know it's the normal move for an artist to as they move towards orthodoxy they start asking themselves that they should paint icons, and uh, but I had a very particular love of traditional Christian art. I spent hours and hours studying it. I would go to universities and take out books and look at ancient manuscripts, and I just spent days and days just kind of imbibing in that language. So I had a very deep desire to participate, but it was really difficult at the time to find a teacher. In 2003, it was very difficult. I took like one little icon painting class, I remember, but it was very, it was a great teacher, but it was very summary. And it was just difficult to find that training. So, in which tradition? I mean, it was really just whatever you could find, like whether you could find a Greek. Uh, the, the one I did was with a Greek iconographer, but I also really loved Russian iconography. And so, 
So what happened is as I was studying and I was also studying iconology at the University of Sherbrooke with uh, Father, uh, Father Stephen Freeman, who has written several books on iconology, my parents, uh, they cut down a yard in their tree and they said, you know, we have this wood, this linden wood, you know, uh, basswood. We hear it's good for carving. Would you like to try it out? And so I thought, all right, I'll do that. And I, I took a like a log, a piece of wood. And I had no idea. I'd never really done anything like that before. And I tried to carve a blessing cross. Uh, it was pretty horrendous. I mean, I, I, didn't, <laughs> I had X-Acto knives. I carved the entire thing with X-Acto knives, like the, actually the shape of the cross with X-Acto knives. And then I don't know how I, I managed, but I finally carved this cross. Um, and uh, But I really enjoyed it. When, and I even brought it to church and, you know, someone showed it to the priest and he said, you know, keep, keep trying, like keep going. And uh, then my parents, again, on my birthday, they bought me a little carving set, uh, like a, like a small carving set with like, you know, exchangeable handle. And so I thought, all right, now I'm going to, I'm going to really do this. So I went and I bought a wooden panel that was already prepared at a, at a wood shop. And uh, I carved the icon actually that's back there, right there. The, the, the triptych of Christ, uh, you know, in glory with the mother of God and St. John, the, the foreigner on the side as a triptych that can be folded in. And I mean, that took months and months. I mean, it just it just took forever. But when I finished it, I knew that, OK, this is this is pretty good. Like I, I could tell that I, I was very severe in terms of learning how to look at art as an art as an art student. And so I could look at it and think, OK, I think. I think I could maybe do this. Yeah. Um, and so that's what, how it started. I, I, I carved this one triptych. And uh, then I, there was a massive loop in my life because through my whole spiritual quest and, you know, with my wife also, she had certain, she really wanted to live overseas and to work overseas with the poor. And so all of that kind of led us to leaving. And so right after I converted to Orthodoxy, which by the way, nobody do this. This is not a good idea. Don't do this. But that's what I did. So it, within the year after I converted to Orthodoxy, I moved to Congo and then I lived in Africa for seven years. And then I didn't, I barely carved anything. And it was yeah. only at the end of my time there in Kenya that I discovered a, a particular kind of soapstone in Kenya that I really fell in love with. And I lived in a village where they were carving it. So I was able to ask some carvers to help me learn how to carve this stone, how to, how, you know, how to work with it. And then when I got back home from uh, from Kenya, that's when I really kind of started doing it in my first in my spare time and then ultimately full time. Wow. And did you all have a spiritual community out there? In, well, in Congo, I really was connected to the church. It was difficult. It's difficult already. It was kind of exotic for me to become Orthodox, but then to be Orthodox in, in another country country like Congo, <laughs> it was really difficult. So I did, I mean, I did attend uh, a parish uh, quite a few time, you know, at Pasca. And then, you know, I had a parish that I went to, but it became, it was very difficult to, to stay connected. So that's why I told people don't, don't do that. Like it's not, it's not the right, uh, it's not the right way to convert to orthodoxy to do that and just leave right away. Yeah. And, and from all of your writing and talking, and even you're speaking now, I could see like oozing out of you this sort of this wonder and amazement at, at all of that. Was this um, a shared amazement and awe by your close family or friends? Or do you have a more typical story where you almost had to like uh, have an apologia for orthodoxy <laughs> against everyone? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not it was a rocky road for sure and i mean in some ways it still is in some regards but ultimately you know i come from a really great family my father was an it was is was is an amazing man my mother is is wonderful and so my father started reading he started reading the church fathers and uh, when i told him i was going to become orthodox started reading the church fathers started looking into it and really fell in love actually with orthodox theology and orthodox uh, mysticism but then kind of came at the limit for him was uh, litur liturgy, and he really mm -hmm. struggled to participate and to feel at home in liturgy. And of course, the usual Protestant hang-ups and you know the idea of praying to to the Mother of God or to saints and everything. But um, but so so in the end, it's not it's not a, a difficult it's not difficult because we do. My father and I and 
we have a lot of connections in terms of, you know, we both love even some of the same authors like Jean-Claude Larcher or uh, Vladimir Lossky. Like so those are some of, both of us, they're some of our favorite authors. So, so it's been, it's been a rocky road, but it's okay. That's wonderful. And, and over the, the years, you've built this brand, the symbolic world. Can you talk to my audience about what that is and when you think you reached a, a Gladwell tipping point in, in that? <laughs> because that... Point. Well, the, the whole, so when I was really curious about orthodoxy, there was, it was going on in another, in a basic kind of, I could call it a spiritual crisis. And it was happening at the same time as my brother was experiencing similar things. So my brother and I, we really discussed at the time, this is in our early 20s, you know, we had just crazy discussions and reading and searching and everything. And that's when both of us started to, to kind of discover symbolic thinking and to, you know, kind of deepen uh, the thinking to a certain extent, to a point where we actually had this whole language that we were using and that we felt like nobody else understood really. And so we spent i mean it's it's not it's not hard to say that we spent 20 years kind of developing this on our own and kind of not on our own because it was based i think it was definitely based on traditional symbolic ideas like it was based mm -hmm. on the church fathers and on you know on the kind of symbolic structures you see in in different traditions but we were trying to find a way to communicate that way in a modern manner and so at first i was doing it through orthodoxy you know, I wrote for years on a on a, a blog called the symbol uh, called uh, the Orthodox Art Journal, where I would interpret icons using these types of symbolic patterns that I had, had developed with my brother. But then ultimately, uh, I met Jordan Peterson in 2015, mm -hmm. and when I heard him, I heard him on the radio, and when I heard him on the radio, I felt like there was something very close to what I was trying to do. Not exactly, but there was enough connection that I reached out to him and ultimately we met and he felt the same about what I was doing. You know, he was really excited about what I was doing. And so we kind of worked with each other at the outset before it became super famous. Um, and that's what kind of propelled me. He kind of threw me out there, you know, put me on his YouTube channel a few times. And then we did some talking events at the outset in 2016 and 2017 before he became like, you know, world famous. And was that uh, like a local that's comedian what, tour? Yeah, I mean, just even right before his first book tour, basically, that's what that's when we were kind of doing this. And then finally, so what that led to is people just writing me people, I, I started getting emails from people every day. And it was very weird. All of a sudden, I felt like this was the moment, I guess, to address these things in a more popular setting. And because people were asking questions, and it was a lot of atheists, I, I had thought that I would talk to Christians and maybe help Christians rediscover these symbolic patterns. But all of a sudden I was like, no, no, no. The, half of the people writing me are atheists who are, you know, looking for meaning. They're trying to find a, a path. And so I started making videos because that's what Jordan was doing. So I thought, Hey, you know, this seems to work. Let's do that. Yeah. And that's what happened. And so this has been, this was now like four years ago, almost five years ago now. And, uh, and it just been slowly growing and growing and, uh, you know, this year I felt like, especially this year, I felt like I, I kind of, like you said, I reached a kind of point where, okay, things are, things are really exciting and there's a lot of opportunities that are presenting themselves to me. So yeah, it's a strange, it's strange. I never could have predicted it, but I'm, it's fun. I love it. It's, I mean, could, who would have thought that I could talk about all these things to atheists and, you know, and a lot of them would think would be interested, just interested in, talking about Jesus to atheists, you know, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, I don't do it maybe as bluntly as that, but in the end, that's kind of what I end up doing. Yeah, that is the end goal. And it's, it's a very interesting split that you have there, because I think both types of education are very necessary, but I think a lot of ministers, and although you might not be an ordained minister, right, it's, it's a, it's a type of ministry. And I think ministers are often not intentional about identifying and distinguishing their audience the way you just did. So what would be, for example, the difference in how you approach discussing a Christian versus an atheist? So the way that I, I tend to talk to atheists is mostly to help them see the inevitability of, first of all, patterns, the inevitability of stories, the inevitability 
of meaning, really. And then slowly start to try to help them see how, you know, these, even the myths, the fairy tales, all these stories that we have, these legends, they're not arbitrary. They, they have a structure, which is something like the structure of attention. The fact that we can pay attention to them means that they can't be arbitrary. And we know that because some stories are boring and some stories are interesting. And some stories, you know, continue through generations and then some stories just, some stories just disappear. So there are characteristics of, about, of stories that make them survive through the generations. And those are objective. You can look at them and find them. And then trying to help people see that that's what's going on in the Bible, the, these stories. And that the, the way in which we exist in stories and the way in which we exist in our body in a kind of embodied way is the primal mode of understanding. And that actually scientific understanding, which is can be technically true, is is an abstraction from that. It's a secondary point. And and so when I do that, I can go back into the biblical text and say, read this as if this is, you know, this, you're living in a world, you do live in that world, right? The world where you experience things coming to you, where you have friends and strangers, where you have, uh, you know, the sun going up in the east, going down in the west, you know, you have high mountains and and you have these, so it's like trying to get back into your body and understand that water isn't first H2O. Like water is something that you drink, something you bathe in. It's all these things that you experience, but not it's not a chemical formula at the outset. It's technically true that it's made of these things. But a car, like a car is made for driving before you describe its parts. Like that's what, try to get that experiential symbolism. So that's what I do with atheists. And then with, with, with Christians or with more religious people, then I try to help them see how scripture and our tradition is really a kind of map of reality. It really kind of brings us deeper into, into the real, you know, in ways that, that maybe they, especially for a lot of Christians that have just accepted the secular point of view without knowing it, I think it's helpful to bring them back into that, into that space. Yeah, it is. It's definitely helpful because sometimes they don't even realize that they have <laughs> accepted that secular view. And on on what points I always try to remind people, and I think it's it's almost a cliche at this point, but, you know, God is not a building. We know that from Corona. God is not a, a Sunday at this time period. But in especially in the homeland of all these Orthodox countries, God, like the church was the basis of how cities are built uh, in circles around it. And the entire society's mores are are formed on that idea. So it's 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 all encompassing and and immersing. So I'm I'm glad that you were so intentional in, in reaching out to those people. When I first came across your content was around that time, and I had encountered Jordan Peterson as as well. Um, I'd heard him speak of the Russian literature a lot, both modern and and older. And so I, I almost thought, like, is there some Russian Orthodox guy whispering in his ear? And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that was you or someone else or if he kind of already was on his radar because he was kind of aware of it, at least tangentially, if not, I think, in his home province. Yeah, it wasn't me that, that did that. That's one of the reasons why I think we were able to communicate very well is that because he was getting a lot of he was getting some of his thinking from Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn, especially then hiding behind that was something like St. Maximus the Confessor or you know, more ancient type of Christian thinking. And so I think that that's why he, he was, that's why a lot of people when he's, he was speaking, it was funny because a lot of people were saying, thought he was Orthodox or that he was kind of crypto Orthodox or they, they weren't sure. They felt like he was speaking in a way that was close to the Orthodox way of thinking. Although they're basic, they're really strong differences, let's be honest. He's obviously says really wacky things sometimes. And you know it's it's fine to, to to see that, but there's something about it that there's a flavor sometimes that resembles uh, orthodox thinking. Let's say. Yeah, if I had to summate his views, and I know you know whether people try to put him politically on the left or right, and how he self identifies from just his clinical psychological practice and from everything that emanates on how he tries to create incremental change, he seems fundamentally like an individual. You and I are parts of these larger institutions that have these larger shared narratives, some of which are dogmatic. And so, yeah, we're not gonna uh, perhaps be as as wacky, whereas he he really is coming at it as an individual, as himself, which may be part of that appeal. When I first came across your content around that time, um, but before I ever did your show, I remember thinking that 
uh, about the the kind of original split in the church biblical schools, the the schools of Alexandria and Antioch. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that split, but the the school of Alexandria seemed to be more interested. Both had uh, symbols that they're interpreting and metaphors and the types of of Christ and the foreshadowing. But the Antiochian school seemed more grounded in in the kind of everyday reality and living of the of the people was in a sense more rural and you see more abstract thought in the cosmopolitan really greek cities and i i thought you were more in that in that greek camp because you were with the greeks but i i heard you expositing ephraim the syrian and I, i'm wondering if you if you see any tensions between like the syriac and and the greek uh, patristics in terms of stories or you you just see the same sort of story being told in another way there i think I, I mean i see the same i think that in some ways i feel closer to syria to the syrian position because it's typological and it's structural i do think that like the characteristic that you talked about the antioch versus uh alexandria school i think it's a little overdrawn to be honest mm -hmm. there's i think there's a difference of approach let's say but there's a sense in which the 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 more especially the Syrian the Syrian Christians they really had more of a Jewish connection or they were closer to Semitic thought and so they were they were more they were more typological directly that is Saint Ephraim's poem on the paradise is just it's wonderful I mean it's so amazing because he's he is so immersed in biblical narrative so deeply immersed that he's able to connect all these things together but if you take a text like saint ephraim's uh hymns of, on paradise and you take saint gregor of nisa's uh life of moses they're saying the same thing they're saying the same thing they're even using the same structure of a mountain and an ascent you know and you know something above which is beyond knowledge and then the waters below as in the flood uh in the in the sense of ephraim and then the waters of of uh of the crossing of the red sea in terms of saint gregory they're just it's really the same pattern it's it's a little different because let's say saint ephraim tends to remain very like really close to the typology and that's what makes it so powerful like this powerful poetic typology whereas saint gregory will like give you his interpretation he'll tend to interpret more but if you look at his interpretations you'll notice that they're that they're completely in line with what what saint ephraim says in my in my opinion um you know there are there are some fathers that are maybe more you could say metaphorical that tend to go into metaphor and to allegory a little more but usually what's hiding behind the allegory is a, is a structural truth and so what i what i what i mean by structural truth is that they can see a structural relation, a connection in the structural relation of a ancient text with what Christ is saying, and they can see that there's a, there's a, there's actually a symbolic relationship, a, a, a structural relationship in terms of the elements how they are put together. And then what they do is then they they'll they'll like, let's say, extrapolate that into some kind of let's say spiritual lesson that they're giving, and so they'll talk about you know hope or they'll talk about something. But usually that they, it's not arbitrary. They're not just like throwing it out there. They're seeing something in the text which has coherence, and now they're applying it to, to more kind of uh, spiritual direction, you could say. And so it's really, I think, just differences of approach. But in the end, it ends up being very, very similar. But I'm yeah, mostly I... interested in typology. Like typology is where I get, let's say, almost all of my let's say my the food my spiritual food comes from typology so reading the canons and seeing you know comparing uh let's say comparing the mountain of sinai to the mother of god you know talking about you know the burning bush like these types of images i think is where i get most of my my food yes yeah, so we have attributed to saint ephraim although i i don't personally believe he authored it although it's possible it's in in the school of of saint ephraim something called the Marian praise in the is right tradition oh and in there it brings up the burning bush it brings up the staff of aaron which is able to have uh, leaves sprout from it um it, it brings up rock that has water 
coming out of it, which yeah. is the, the water of life. It brings up the gate of the eastern gate of Ezekiel, yeah. which only the Lord entered. Uh, very things that I think are common to other uh, Orthodox churches, but things that are also unique. And and all of this, uh, it's all incarnational and Trinitarian doctrine being told. And then every few lines, it'll say, pray for us, holy woman. And mm. so it's uh, it's called the Marian praise. It's one for each day. And the Ethiopians devoutly usually pray it as part of their 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 daily prayers. An another saint, though, I, I was even in inside of an Episcopal parish that some Ethiopians were renting here in, in Southern California. And I saw the great image of a medieval knight of uh, St. George just kind of standing on his own. But I know you've been working on it. And I love, um, I'm a big fan of the entrepreneur Gary Vaynerchuk, who always talks about documenting the process. So I love how you begin with the black and white stencil, then you color it in and you're constantly getting feedback from your fans as you produce the artwork. So could you talk to us about St. George and, and the work that you're working on? <clears throat> Well, I, yeah, right now I'm working on a St. George design. It's actually for a carving at the outset. But now, let's say the way I'm working is I try to join together the different threads of what I'm doing. And so if I'm creating a new image or a new a new format of an image that, I, that I'm interested in, what I often do is I'll take the time to draw it out properly. You know, maybe I'll color it. Maybe I'll make a print out of it. And so I'll have the print coming out. Or if it's a, an image that's appropriate on other products, let's say, I'm careful not to not to use any image on all kinds of products, but you know, I, I think especially warriors, like warrior saints and war and and protectors, I kind of like the idea of having that on clothing. Like I would mm -hmm. never put an image of Christ on a t-shirt, for example, like just an icon of him. But I like mm -hmm. the idea of of like warriors on clothing because they're like protectors. So so I, I I try to find a ways to to develop that. Um, and then ultimately that image will be carved and it'll be a carving for someone. And so often I'll make it for someone and then maybe later I'll make another version that is more ornamented that has maybe some some uh, you know some something that increases it at some point so that's right which reminds me of an earlier point of the viral moment or the tipping point that we we're talking about earlier where there was there a point in which you had a day job and this was just a pet project and they're like man I got all these emails I got to switch over and and do this full time or are you still kind of doing that it was interesting, actually, because when I got back from Kenya, I obviously I didn't think I was going to carve icons, but I had a secret prayer that I could carve icons. Like I had this kind of secret prayer that that's what I would do. And uh, then for about a year and a half, everything that I tried to do fell through, like everything that I tried to to every project, things that so really hopeful, like not pipe dreams, like things that really had you know, a good friend of mine was starting a company and it just looked like it was going to like we had everything set up and all we were waiting for is like the final financing. And it just kept dragging on and dragging on. And and uh, for about a year and a half, I, I was in this situation and the whole time, like, you know, I was in my own prayers. I was thinking, OK, what is going on? Like, God, what is it that you want from me? What is it that you want me to do? I don't totally understand why all these things are failing. It's not something that it that had been usual in my life. Usually, you know, I, I just do things and I do my, I do the things I try to do them well and, you know, they have their own success. And so after about a year and a half of this, almost two years, that's when, you know, and while I was doing that, I was carving in my spare time just to not go crazy. And, you know, mm -hmm. I put up a little website, you know, put up a few images, send it out a few emails, you know, you know, maybe come see my carvings. And uh, like I said, after a year and a half, I realized, that I had nothing in front of me. There, I had no, the last like job possibly that I had had fallen through. And then I realized that I had about $10,000 worth of orders for carving. And it was like, it kind of crept up on me. And I thought, <laughs> okay, well, I don't have anything else to do. Like, this is really the only thing I have to do. And so I made one carving and then I made another and I made another. And then that was, you know, that was like seven years ago or eight years ago or whatever. And so now, yeah. So, so now I have a three year waiting list. And so that Amazing. that's, yeah. But I also don't do that full time anymore because of the videos and stuff. But mm -hmm. for a long while I did it full time. I hired an, I have a, an assistant that I hired now to kind of help me prepare things so that I, so that I can keep carving while I'm doing the other stuff. 
Oh, I was getting excited. I thought you were going to like saying like an apprentice, like you've got a school of carvers. Well, I maybe one day. It's just that here in Quebec, it's maybe not the right place, you know, considering and now it's one of the most secular places in the world. But so I have an assistant, which is actually who is actually an old friend of mine that I've known for many years, who kind of helps me to just prepare things and uh, and kind of finishes the mob, does this shipping and all that stuff. You know, he's great. He's really he's really wonderful. Yeah, I um, I didn't I didn't want to uh, trouble you on and and talk about that now, but now I I can't help uh, thinking about it because there is a lot going on in the world in Ethiopia, in Russia and Ukraine, but not to forget our our near brothers and sisters in Canada and and especially in in Quebec and all over the place. How how has uh, everything that's been going on in Canada been uh, in terms of, you know, personally and, and spiritually? Yeah. Well, I've usually been careful not to dive into politics too much, especially mm -hmm. not international politics. I always yeah. feel like it's so difficult to know what's going on, you know, internationally. There's so much propaganda and there's so much r rumors and stuff. So I, I really have always tended not to, you know, I can see what's going on in Ethiopia and obviously in Ukraine now and or in Syria, what was happening in Syria not a long time ago or or in Yemen. I mean, in Somalia, it's just like there's a lot of conflicts in the world right now. Um, and so obviously now, like the, the, the Russia, Ukraine one is a little closer to home because because you're talking about Orthodox people who are fighting each other. And so that kind of hits a little closer. I did a video on that today just to, because a lot of people were asking you, like, why aren't you saying anything about it? So I realized that my usual silence at international events maybe had to kind of be broken, at least for one video. But here in Quebec, you know, I was, obviously I, I've been annoyed with what's been going on ever since the beginning of, of COVID. I, there was something weird that I perceived right from the outset in terms of where this was going you know, in terms in terms of state control and in terms of digital identity and all the things that are kind of ahead 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 of us right now, mm -hmm. um, and and it, and also the idea of a of a digital currency. So I've been very wary about what has been happening, and sadly, to my I guess not me, but the people that that I that I'm involved with or that I talk to that have also were also perceiving that it seems like this is what's going on, like this is what's happening, um, and so we've seen our our own government become more and more tyrannical in the past two years and doing it in a weird blind way while talking about democracy you know the way that the the trucker convoy was treated here was really scary because they shut down people's bank accounts and people think that that's normal that's not normal like government should not be able to a murderer is allowed to have his bank account by the way you know someone who rapes someone is allowed to have their bank account and so the idea that shutting down people's bank account is a normal political gesture from a government the fact that people think that is crazy and so this is where we are um and i think that it's just going to increase and you can see it with the war that's happening in ukraine you can see that it's moving more and more in that direction because these are the type of sanctions that people are putting on russia and so i understand people are angry with russia because what they're doing is unacceptable but the weird sanctions of shutting people's bank accounts and you know let's say you have a google pay account and you mm -hmm. get come to the store and then it doesn't work anymore and people telling asking elon musk to shut down teslas it's like that's what's waiting us for us all of us in the future where the where there's there's a power to turn off your life and that's what that's what worries me let's say about what's happening in canada because yeah. they're going to keep the the passport the vaccine passport they're going to keep it they're they they've they're 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 not going to use it for a while but they're saying we're going to keep it which means that this is this is where it's going so yeah they're keeping it up its sleeves la i i, I work in a public high school and um la allowed the vaccinated to be unmasked a couple weeks ago everyone a week ago but uh the unions may hold on throughout the rest of the school year it's yet to be seen either things will be lifted for schools this Friday, or it'll be an ongoing battle. And it, yeah, it, you know, in the grander scheme of things going on, it, it's uh, it's not as crazy. It's what's going on in Canada and in the Horn of Africa and in Europe, 
but uh, you know, it's, just, it's annoying. And the, the, the Canadian thing that you said about bank accounts is why I personally, and I also encourage others to find things like Urbit and things like cryptocurrencies. Not that I, I think sometimes cryptocurrencies are like stocks, the way they're so volatile, but the, the element of like a, a treasure wallet, which is like har uh, hardware or the samurai wallet, the organizations that are built for your kind of individual sovereignty and protection where people can't just turn you off. I, I had a, two of my most recent podcast guests were people who had been doing research and work with, with Urbit, which is a whole different way of accessing the internet that doesn't allow anybody to, to kick you off. So I, I can definitely appreciate that, but we, we did mention Ethiopia and, and now it's being mentioned in a sort of political lens on your program, you had me, you had Richard Rowland and yourself, and you talked about the mystical and symbolic uh, religious aspects of Ethiopia. When I was a kid growing up in the early 90s, it was, uh, well, in the later 90s, it was South Park uh, bringing up the stuff from the early 90s and the 80s, Bono and, and all these other organizations saving the children. Because yeah, the, of the, star the starving Ethiopians. Yeah, that that's yeah the starving Marvin and the Arthenopians of South Park. That that's kind of what I grew up on, and uh, I'm wondering what was the first image of Ethiopia that that you can recall? Like, was it something you were geopolitically aware of as a as a child? As a child, I I I'm gonna say something horrible because to be uh, the first the first memory I have of Ethiopia being a child in the eighties was someone, not my, not my parents, but someone in the church where I was going saying that the reason why there was a famine in Ethiopia was because, because they were not Christians. Like they were, mm -hmm. they, they were idolaters, you know? Uh, and so that's actually my first memory of Ethiopia, which is horrible, man, what a horrible thing. Um, and, but then luckily later in much later in life, when I was kind of interested in, in traditional Christian art, I became very fascinated by Ethiopian iconography and also just the fact of Ethiopia, like the, just this weird gem that that nobody talked about. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, like this has been around for since when? Like this has been around since forever, I guess, like since since. And so and so kind of discovering the, the legends of the Ark and, you know, the just the deep the the deep root the deep connection to let's say orthodox christianity but also the deep differences that are there as well and how there's something extremely particular about the way ethiopia exists and about its own identity and how it sees its christianity in relationship to let's say its ancient jewish uh, uh connection and all of that stuff i was really let's say in my early 20s when i became orthodox i was really fascinated by ethiopia so I was so happy when I had a chance to go, you know, when I lived in Kenya, um, it was just, it's wonderful. Like it's my trip to Ethiopia, I would say is going to, it's, let's say they have some of my most vivid memories, like strong memories of, and also a sense of the magical, like a sense that, that it's a, a world that is still really deep in this traditional worldview and that anything is possible there. So so that's kind of like my story with Ethiopia. And then I, I, I even carved, I don't know if, you, I guess I didn't never showed you, but I, I carved a, an image of an Ethiopian style image of uh, Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And then I, I transcribed some text from the Kibber and Agast at the bottom of the, of the text, you know, where Solomon is, is wondering at this, this strange woman that comes from afar, you know, and, uh, and he says, what do I know? Like he keeps repeating, like, what is it? What, you know, like, what do I know? And then uh, the text of the, the queen, when she talks about him as this fair, this beautiful, like fair man. And so anyway, so I've always been, since at least my early twenties, I've been fascinated by Ethiopia. Yeah. You, you did tell me about that. And you said there was a funny reaction when you <laughs> had showed it to one of the Ethiopian locals. I don't know if he was a tour. No, guy that's not that image. It was another okay. image. So did I tell you that in our, our podcast? Like yeah. I met the guardian of the ark and he, 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 uh, he blessed an icon that I made, but when he looked at it, he said it was a little icon of Christ. And when he looked at it, he said, Oh, it's modern. And I thought it's so hilarious. Like only the, only like in Ethiopia, could someone look at my 
carving and say it's modern you know it's like <laughs> yeah so that, i still i keep that very preciously that carving i'm never gonna i'm never gonna get rid of it especially in semitic christianity but i think in all of christianity the point of repetition is that it emphasizes a point so i think it, it bears repeating the the nile begins on lake tana and you had an amazing interaction on on that lake tana if i'm not mistaken yeah and when you were inquiring certain things of potentially uh, a set a more secular tour guide or he was at least reluctant to maybe reveal certain knowledge to you i think that was a phenomenal i was crying when you told that story and i heard it yeah do you want me to tell it again i can tell it again Please. If you want. yeah so when i was on lake tana i was going towards the island you know where the monasteries are and the uh my guy was like a rasta guy you know i mean he was he was very just wearing a t-shirt he had dreadlocks or whatever and uh, i'm looking at the lake and i mean there's something about that lake which is so i don't know how to explain it there, there's something about it and also because the uh the islands have a lot of trees like they're they're, they're quite they're, they're quite luscious you know and so kind of moving towards these islands and i look at the lake and i'm like man i'm sure I'm sure there's a monster in this lake <laughs> and so i asked the guy i said i said is there a monster in this lake and i could tell in his eyes that he doesn't want to answer because he's you know like he's a guy just he's, he just wants to be a modern guy you know and so he looks at me and he says he says yeah yeah there's a monster in this lake and then he says the most amazing thing which is he says he says this monster will devour people like will bring people down into the water and will keep them for six days and then release them on the sabbath and i thought man that's so amazing so that was just so amazing yes there's this deep tradition of competing monastic centers and the different monastic centers have different emphases and one of them the school of a monk called eustatios had this huge emphasis on the original sabbath kind of like seventh day adventists but centuries before the seventh day adventists mm, yeah you know like in the 12 and 1300s and into the 1400s i don't know when the seventh day adventists start but i i know there's centuries after they're not there you know, old, after that's the for sure movie. they're not old yeah. at all i i think they're 1800s in america yeah uh, that, that'd be my my guess without looking it up but so this is centuries before them and the emperors particularly one emperor zara Jacob, were trying to centralize the various beliefs because we had this Coptic Abun or Metropolitan, yeah. but really this was a figurehead position. And I have a lot of questions about all the people who've ever occupied that role. And what did they do? I was, I was wondering about that too. Did they even understand the language? Like, could they even know what was going on around them? I've heard of a few who actually did and okay. who were involved. And it was mostly about enforcing the Miaphysite Christology okay. when various, um, other christological heresies arose a lot of people don't know this about ethiopia is that in english writing especially will be written off as monophysites and sometimes i count that as a, a blessing or a grace from god because it's wrong but if they only knew all the <laughs> crazy beliefs people have you know there's a, a sect called Malakut that some monks genuinely believe and they don't learn arithmetic properly and somehow they get to three times three equals nine. And so they believe that the Trinity are nine divinities or nine persons. There's another one called Saga, which is grace, and another Kabat. And I, I really get them confused, but they're different versions of doubting the, the humanity and, and the divinity of Christ or saying it occurs at, at certain moments in his life. And they're, they're totally off. And some of them might be close to Arianism and, and all these other things, but they were never formal splits they never had formal schism it's things that are kind of so they continue to exist in communion with each other yes okay but 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 if you really looked at what they believed it would be it's like so weird and radically different from what would say mainline the mainline uh ethiopians would believe but that would be yeah. that would happen in mostly in monasteries i imagine mostly in monasteries the faithful have no idea about it and they, and they don't even like they never would openly preach about it or talk about it right and they would never have like a council again this is the semitic thinking like they're not going to have a summa theologica and uh you know uh, and and argue with the people 
um, to try to convince them. It's mm. something that they would share with like their close students. And, It'd be and more like a students. secret knowledge kind of that they would teach their their students. Yeah, yeah. That's what it feels like, almost Gnostic, yeah, in that yeah. in that way. And the role of the abun or the bishop, uh, the metropolitan uh, from the Copts would be to kind of combat those Christological things. But for example, this Sabbath talk, they never liked it, but it was so popular they couldn't do anything about it. And And the emperors would play a larger role than the bishop in saying, okay, you guys want to worship on Saturday, then let's worship on Saturday and Sunday. How about that for a couple? Okay. So they had both. They they celebrated both. That's amazing. Because I think early Christians actually did celebrate both. And then slowly as Christianity kind of took shape and became more and more um, established, it seems like then they, they moved towards just Sunday. And then also as there was something like, I don't know, something like uh, I would – a need to distance yourself from Judaism too, mm -hmm. you know, then, then that became a point where it's like a desire to kind of distance yourself, especially as, right. as, as, the, as Jews continue to exist in the Roman empire. And, you know, there was some conflict and competition between the group. So, yeah. Which the Ethiopians never wanted to do to the contrary. They wanted to emphasize their, their Jewishness and say they're more Jewish than the Jews, if anything. Yeah. But the weirdest thing about Ethiopia is like the idea that there were still like the the Ethiopian Jews up there in the mountains or whatever for two thousand years. Like, just would they just marry amongst themselves? Like, how did they survive that long? Yeah, there are a lot of different theories about them. The one that I tend to believe is um, it's interesting symbolically, but it may appear to some people in a more secular fashion is that. I believe that the original creators of the Aksumite civilization are some sort of uh, hybridization of the local Kushites, who themselves are the earliest hybrid Eurasian Africans on, on the planet. And it's like another Eurasian mix comes in. Uh, so the numbers are kind of different, but roughly the Kushites are kind of 60-40, African favoring African. And the, the Amhara and the Tigray, which are the Aksumites, are closer to 50-50. And each individual is going to differ, but on a population level, that, that's pretty accurate. And after that second kind of Eurasian admixture or um, hybridization, those people who came were Semites. And it was their culture and their, their language which became dominant. And as they pushed from the Red Sea and you know kept mixing and mixing and, and pushing down, there were a group of Kushites in Northwest Ethiopia who were the most resistant to that. And when, it, when they accepted Christianity, as in many parts in the world, it was because it was the dominant power and they did so in a very surface level way. So when theological controversies arose, they said, forget this, we'll go back to the original. So mm -hmm. I think that they're, they're actually the the people who identify as ethiopian jews don't actually have anything like the west asian dna they have some other untraceable eurasian dna but not that but they adopted this cultural story of being like jewish right, of, and being of from return Poland. of going back to something that preceded christianity yeah yeah and, and that's an the, interesting theory and the people they were resisting were actually from there and mm -hmm. and could be for example one biology paper i read even said they could be from the tribe of dan the mm -hmm. one of the sea peoples during the bronze age collapse uh coming down and then mixing with the the local african uh kushites huh. so like the double hybridization people i mean it's 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 incredible because you resist the dominant power by by taking their narrative as your own and mm -hmm. saying that it's it's your name. You're more original, like more original, maybe. Yeah, interesting. One of the things for sure that's interesting is I when I was in, um, I forget where I, I, I think I, I maybe an actual, I'm not sure, but I met these I met these Jewish scholars there. It was just really weird. These three Jewish scholars that were there, and they came there because they were interested. They were interested in the connection between Ethiopia and Israel, like if there was mm -hmm. some. One of the things they told me was that the Ethiopian Jews, the ones that are in Israel right now, he, he said, obviously, their practices are so different from all the other Jews that it's like they struggle to to, to be able to connect with each other. But he's, he says he goes to these to the different rituals that they have. And he says sometimes they have rituals where 
they walk out with these things that are wrapped, you know, in cloth and they have them over their head and they're walking with them. And he says, I'm sure those are the tabot, like they're the yeah. same things that would you would find in an Ethiopian church. And for him, it was it's basically was saying they're probably much closer to Ethiopian Christians in all their practices and beliefs than they are to, to the Jews that are in Israel, let's say. They, they they are certainly that in in a certain sense what i think people don't understand going to your point about people not knowing like what their biases are is like we talk about judaism a lot and judaism after the the crushing of the temple in 70 a.d basically has a protestant reformation they abolish the clergy and they go all teachers which is basically protestantism before protestantism yeah and the ethiopian jews have the Kohanim, they have the clergy. And so one oh, of the really? things- like, So they have a kind of, uh, uh, they have a cast of, of uh, really? Of priests, yeah. And that's really? one of the things is they were continuing to do animal sacrifice into the 20th and 21st centuries. And the state of Israel, because it's such an existential threat to them to have like all the priests being Ethiopian, they would stipulate that you can't get like government welfare unless you stop appointing new priests and just accept like the rabbinical revolution. Really? I didn't know that. Wow. And so do, do they have ways of, let's say, demonstrating that they're descendants of the of the original Cohen, like that they're the dis descendants of the of the tribe? Because yeah, the they they have their oral record of, you know, their father and their yeah. father's father and their father's father. And each person is required a minimum of seven, but they there sh should also be like a certain few elite scholars who should be able to trace all the way back. Like, let's say to, to Aaron or to the Levites. That's amazing. Yeah. That's astounding. Yeah. I did not know about that, 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 that for, for Israel, let's say that's a serious, like prop, like political problem to imagine that all your Levites, all your Cohen or most of them are Ethiopian. It's, it's ex super existential because even today I, I was, I was reading an older Jewish text the other day and it said that they give a place of honor to the, to people who have Levi in their last name and people who have Cohen in their last name. But even that place of honor is as a parishioner, not as like a acting priest. Yeah. So if you have actual priests, that would like supersede that. And they would it would immediately like turn the Ethiopians into the Sadducees because, you know, the Sadducees were the ones who dominated the temple in, in that time. And yeah. that would be very weird for them. It, it would be a weird inversion that, that they're not um, used to, which I think is actually um, a, a great segue. While we're talking about Ethiopia, within our communion is the Armenian communion. And of course I was sad as, as any good person who sees that opportunity would be at, at the splitting of uh, Kanye and, and Kim Kardashian. I know you have talked about the symbols in Kanye and I had just had two uh, close friends. I, they invited me, but I wasn't able to go. Uh, I was busy. They went to the Grammy Museum here in downtown Los Angeles, and they went to see the the new Genius uh, documentary, which is on Netflix about yeah, yeah. Kanye as well. But I know you've been kind of following him over the past few years. Can you talk a little bit about that imagery? Because I've commented on what if he, you know, tried to win her back by becoming more Armenian than her and became like super Armenian. Yeah, and well, I mean, I've been interested in Kanye since two thousand four. Like I, I, re I remember hearing Jesus walks back then and thinking what is this song there's something about this song which is very particular the way in which he would he was kind of flipping things over where he was he was using kind of let's say gangster culture but he was flipping it to make it so that it was turned towards christianity somehow it was very odd um and so i've been kind of following since then and seeing him weirdly flip-flop between at first a kind of catholic catholicism and then into this kind of wild uh, degeneracy um and then i kind of lost hope for him at some point when his mother died he just went way off the rails and i even stopped listening to his music because it was just so vulgar Same. that it was just impossible to listen to um and then when and then when he kind of had this weird conversion experience i just started paying attention to him again and i and i talked about the notion of the fool and the let's say the function of the fool and how let's say the fool is this is something which comes from my brother's book uh, matthew's book the notion of the the idea that the fool is always trying to turn things he's always trying to do the opposite you could say or trying to show the underside of things and if you think about a court jester for example 
but that there comes a moment when the world is so upside down that the fool will now do the opposite. The fool will end up still looking like a fool, but showing the right side up. And so in 20, in, in 2020, I mean, some of the things, Kanye was saying things that no one was allowed to say. He was the only one who was allowed to say it. And he was allowed to talk against abortion. He, he, he ran for president and said that his platform was prayer. And that, yes. and that the only thing which could unite America would be prayer. And I thought, like, it makes you laugh because it's funny, but it's also true, right? It's also something that no one is allowed to say. Not even a Christian um, politician would be allowed to say that if we all prayed together, that is, if we all focused on something transcended together at the same time, then that would heal a lot of the, a lot of the problems. Um, and so, anyway, so I've been following him, but he's definitely... A wild card. I keep telling people, like, watch the fools. That's the term I use. Watch the fools because they can kind of surprise you by showing you the right side up again. But then don't follow them because, man, like Kanye is, he keeps going off. Like, he keeps kind of losing, losing his, his step, let's say. Um, but I still think it's worth watching him because, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Like, it, it is under, it is while he was becoming a Christian that the that the most secular family the kardashians all of a sudden she had her kids baptized in armenia mm -hmm. and it was i mean obviously she made it into a photo op and all those things that she does but still there's something about that which was really surprising and yeah kind of shocking yeah and then he did the album emmanuel which was all gregorian chant who kanye did that yeah, you haven't heard that? No, what is this? Oh, I don't you know. have to check that out. He has a whole, it's like a, I don't know if it's, I think it's called an EP. No, no, EP is the extended play. Oh, I forget what the short one is called. It's like four tracks or five tracks, and it's all just Gregorian chant, and it's called Not heard that. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'll definitely have to look into that. I mean, I know that his album, Jesus is King, I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. I thought it was wonderful, and yeah. I also thought that it was really like a trickster move that he did, and, and he... He was acting like a fool because he said, and he's like, basically, I'm going to call my album Jesus King. And now, like, everybody that talks about it, in, if we're ill or for good, has to say Jesus is King. Like, they have to mm -hmm. say that. They have to, they have to repeat that phrase. And so I just thought that was hilarious. But I have to definitely have to look into that, that, uh, that Gregorian chant. Yeah, especially because it's him getting more high church. I've worked in South LA, as I said, in, in some historically downtrodden schools, and I've met a couple of black boys who their mothers, one of them explicitly told me she put sir in the first name so that anytime someone addresses them, they had to say sir and then Joseph or sir, you know, Jonathan, Enoch, whatever the guy's name is. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, there's, there's power there in the name, obviously. And through... I have this hope, like I, I, it's weird. I have like the secret hope that I think that if, if, Kanye, someone like Kanye, especially Kanye, because he is a genius. Like if Kanye could get a sense of some of these symbolic patterns that I'm talking about, I mean, he could, what he could do with that would be like amazing. Cause he's still, he still has the dream of, of constant innovation. And he has that kind of idea of being weird and original, but if he could get it, he, if he could like get us a, a whiff of how powerful a lot of these patterns are, I mean, I think he could go, he, he would go nuts, but yeah, whatever we can always dream. It, it should be the united prayer of everyone who is watching this right now that if since Kanye West did Joe Rogan's program, he should do Jonathan Pajot's program. And if he could do Jonathan Pajot's, maybe he'll do mine one day. But definitely That's right. Yours there you go. First. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you going back to uh, Ethiopia, you did this uh, longer series with Richard Rowland, and you talked about ethiopia as it, it was interesting because it's it's kind of the center of the world like in pangea it's like the direct almost the direct center of the world from which you have the bottlenecks and and all the migration patterns but in in scripture and in in the hymnography and the liturgical rubrics it's called the ends of the earth i, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit yeah and well i mean context. from from let's say the the greek let's say from the the mediterranean perspective the the notion of ethiopians was the idea of the the land of the burnt of the burnt people 
And so the way that they understood it was that they were in the extremes. And it's like where the sun goes up and the sun goes goes down, basically. So like the extreme west and the extreme east. It's hard to it's hard to understand it that way, but that's kind of how they perceived it. And so I the the idea was also the the notion that I mean for them it was it was all very vague, obviously. And so it's the idea of someone with darker skin for them it was like a you know the story that it's like they were burnt basically by the sun like they were so they were in the where the sun is is really extreme and so that's that was their their image of it but ultimately what that what happens with that is that it creates an image of Ethiopia as being the edge of the world and the, that edge of the world has positive and negative aspects to it it's a it's a neutral notion and so you see that already in the old testament the idea of the Kushites, the way the Kushites are represented will end up being something like the way that Ethiopians are understood later. And, and Kushite is translated as Ethiopian in, in scripture most of the time anyways. And so you, you get a sense uh, when the Kushites appear that it's related to this coming to the end, but then also something like resurrection or something like the final moment. So you see it, um, you see it in, in, uh, I always forget the name of the prophet. What's the name? Of the, there's a there's a prophet in scripture that that goes into a cistern, and there's a, a Kushite man who pulls him out of the cistern with rotten with rotten rags. Um, this is the second time that I've that I that I've forgotten the name. It's of okay. The Isaiah, Ezekiel, um, Jeremiah, Jonah, Micah, Obadiah, Amos. We'll get it's, yeah, it's, it's it, I think it's Jeremiah. Yeah, I think it's Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Yeah, let me let me just type it in because I just want to make sure. Yeah, it's it's good. There are, there are a lot of prophets. Yeah, it's Jeremiah and the, it's Jeremiah. So Jeremiah was put down in this cistern, and then a, an Ethiopian, uh, a Kushite, comes and pulls him out of the cistern with rotten rags. So it has to do with like the edge, the end, and the new beginning, like. The, that's why it's that's why it's also related to rotten rags like it's like the end of something and a new beginning and i think that that's what you see in the ethiopian eunuch story of the ethiopian eunuch in scripture because the ethiopian eunuch is ethiopian but he's also a eunuch and so in jewish law he would have been excluded from the temple just for being a eunuch so there's a sense in which he represents this extreme which now you know he goes into baptism and philip goes up into heaven like elijah goes up into heaven and leaves the Ethiopian eunuch below, like Elijah is left, uh, like uh, um, not Elijah, Elise. I'm, I'm in. What's it? What is it in English? My brain is not working. Yeah, Elijah is Elisha, is right? So he leaves Elisha below, yeah. and that's what happens in the story of the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch as well. So what you see, what happens in Byzantine tradition, is that there's a sense in which Ethiopia is the ends of the earth, and that. As we reach the ends of the earth, the prophecy in scripture that Ethiopia will raise up its arms to the Lord becomes a relation, becomes connected to the notion of the end. That and also the fact that when Christ says, you know, the queen of the of the east will rise up with the last generation and will judge this generation. So there's a sense in which Ethiopia becomes connected with the end. And so in, in these very particular Byzantine traditions, there's an image that the Ethi that the Byzantine emperor disappears and hides in Ethiopia, basically, mm -hmm. or like or something like Byzantine emperor ship hides in Ethiopia, and at the end of time, in the last moment, that the emperor will rise out of Ethiopia, and that is that will be Ethiopia raising up its hands, and that the 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 Roman slash the Roman slash Ethiopian emperor will give his crown. We'll go to Jerusalem and 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 give his crown up to God, and then that will kind of signify that the end times are upon us. So it's very fascinating. This is like a Byzantine legend. It's not an Ethiopian legend. It's a it's a Greek Byzantine legend in which, by the way, Alexander the Great is also half Ethiopian. He, his mother is Ethiopian, and his father is is a is either Macedonian or sometimes an Egyptian an Egyptian, uh, like a priest or Egyptian pharaoh. And so it's interesting. So they understand that Alexander has to join the extremes together, or join the two sides together. And that is kind of what, the let's say, the last Roman emperor ends up representing.
So it's a fascinating way of seeing the world. It's absolutely fascinating because I think there's no mainstream perspective on this, but this is like the sub sub perspective because the sub perspective that I have heard is that there's the shift from the Western Roman empire, which falls sometime right in the 400s. People debate whether it's gradual or all of a sudden. And then you have the Eastern Roman empire in Constantinople. And then after it falls in the 1400s, there are some people that say after the Mongols left, it was the Russian empire which then takes over the like new Rome title. Yeah, third Rome. You're saying it, it, there's a Byzantine prophecy that actually it was hiding in Africa and that's where it's going to arise, where of course there were about 500 years more of an actual you know, monarchy, a Christian monarchy or, or empire. But this, is, this, this prophecy, first of all, is originated in, in Syria. It's, it, it was taken up by the Byzantines, but it originated in Syria, which would also make sense, right? It would make sense more typologically that they would have more sensibility to Ethiopia as a, as a player in this big game. Uh, but then, then also it's an early thing. It happened at the, kind of at the outset of Islam, probably. Like mm -hmm. not when Constantinople fell. So it, it's way before Constantinople fell that these prophecies kind of uh, people are interested in it. It's called um, it's called the Apocalypse of Pseudo Methodius, and it, yeah, it's definitely worth it's definitely worth people's time because it's very interesting. And it there is a cosmic there's like this a sense of this cosmic function, let's say, of the extreme or the one that goes to the end. And how that kind of comes together in the at the at the at the last moment. Yeah, and and so this story is it something that is prevalent in that Greek tradition that they picked up, or was something that you stumbled upon one day? It was extremely it was extremely popular in the Middle Ages. Like it was very popular, and there are copies of it all over the place. You know, in the West and the East, it became, and then it. It it slowly kind of faded into less a less known uh, like to be less known and less prominent. But um, it definitely had a moment where it's, it was very prominent in the Middle Ages. It was uh, it was quite known this this tradition. So yeah, it's not it's not a it's not an obscure thing. It's a very it was a very popular text that kind of at some point just people a lot of people forgot about. But that is there are a lot of copies of it. That's amazing. And, there, and obviously there's extrapolations on them and there's all these ideas. And and I think that that there's an there's a notion, there's some ideas, for example, like things like um the notion of Prester John, for example, they seem seems to be connected with these types of thinking, where the notion that there would be a uh, a priest who's a king, you know, out there, like far in the east. And a lot of people thought that Prester John was in Ethiopia. Some people thought maybe it was in Mongolia or, you know, around there, let's say in the, the, the Caucasus Mountains or something. But then a lot of people thought he was in Ethiopia. And that's why some of the uh, Crusaders and around the time of the Crusades, people went to Ethiopia to try to find Prester John, basically, to try to find a Christian uh, king ally in the East that could help them defeat or, you know, fight the fight the Muslims. And you see, like, if you go to if you go to if you go to Ethiopia, you'll find weird things like you'll find hospital hospitality. How can I can't say that word? Hospitalers crosses. You find crosses of the different medieval knightly orders. That are like painted or carved in the rock. I mean, it's pretty astounding. And you wonder, like, when did this happen? Like, when did these crosses get here? And it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And there were frequent monastic connections since very early on some people say even the armenian alphabet came about because of these monastic pilgrimages to jerusalem and mm -hmm. that it was islam that slowed it down a little bit but there really was no period in which ethiopia was not sending you know individuals to the holy land and back and so that's probably where they met unless they came to ethiopia themselves yeah because the, because the ethiopians i know that ethiopians have their section in the 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 church of the uh, the holy sepulcher like they so they've probably been there forever like they have the place where they go you know for the for the for the feast and so that's interesting yeah it it it, it definitely could be along those lines on a 
on a different note, we we mentioned St. George earlier, but I know also an, another interest of yours that may not be as familiar to the Ethiopian audience as St. George is, is St. Christopher and and God's Dog. Can you talk about that project and where people could, could yeah, find Yeah, well, it? God's Dog is a, is a comic book. It's a graphic a series of graphic novels that I wrote with my brother and uh, that is being illustrated by a great uh, artist named Cor Nielsen. And what it is, it's basically going into Christian tradition and pulling out, doing, going the opposite of what a lot of people have been doing, which is pulling out all the weirdest stuff we could find and bringing it together into one story and kind of celebrating the the more, uh, the strange aspects of the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. So St. Christopher is a, uh, is a saint, which a lot of people know about because people have St. Christopher on their, the dash of their car, even in America. So it, usually it's like a, a, like a guy with a, a baby on his shoulder and that's a western tradition that actually saint christopher was a giant was a giant canaanite people have even forgotten that that he's a giant that but there's another tradition which is that he was a cenocephalus that is he was a dog-headed man and so our story is basically a kind of pinocchio story of of this dog-headed monster that encounters a group of pilgrims in which saint george is there by the way and of and another a saint who's more famous in ethiopia than Another place is St. Mercurius, mm -hmm. uh, also quite famous in Egypt and in Syria. And so St. Mercurius... the deceased patriarch was named after him. And St. Mercurius, in his tradition, has also dog-headed men, which is why we put him in the story. So according to the legend of St. Mercurius, which you'll find on Ethiopian icons of him, by the way, and in Coptic icons of him, he encountered these, these, uh, these two uh, dog-headed men that had actually killed his father. And he was able to convert the dog-headed men. And they're saints. They're wow. canonized. Like in, in, for sure in the Coptic church, they're canonized. And, uh, and then he would have them as his companions. And he would walk around with these dog-headed men. And, you know, and if need be, he could, let's say, turn them on his enemies if that, if that was necessary. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what God's dog is. It's, so there's giants. There's, uh, there are, there are giants, angels. There's, uh, let's say extreme monastics like St. Simeon the Stylite is in the story and uh, St. George. And uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's like an epic story about, uh, about how to deal with the fringe and how to deal with the, the strange and the edge. I know you've had Bishop Robert Barron from the Catholic church on your program. And he is always talking about, and he's someone I've listened to for a long time myself, being in Los Angeles. I've sadly never met him, but I appreciate how he engages. He does so many film reviews and book reviews, but it seems like you're engaging the culture. It seems like a more, um, like an archaeo-futuristic take on hagiographies. Like you're doing a hagiography in a sense, but not in a formal institutional way, but in a way that engages people you know there's obviously graphic novels are huge and so many graphic novels have become films themselves i mean to me the way that i see it is that i believe in hierarchy i believe that all things are good if they're in their proper place and so in my own artistic work i i love the idea of making something like a, a bishop's crozier or a reliquary that will hold you know the 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 incorrupt uh, remainders of a, of some saint, or that you know that that really participate in the liturgical life, that are in the holy place, that you know are using sacred, are using noble materials, gold and stone and and mosaics. I love doing that, but I also love the idea that there's there's a way in which these notions can bring come all the way down into popular culture, and they have to they also have to be adapted in their form. So that they become appropriate for 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 popular culture, and so if you look at a lot of the things I'm doing, and you can understand it that way, to make sense, to see that I'm trying to have a, a art practice that scales from the holy of holies of the church all the way into making T-shirts and making making uh, things for people, and being careful, being thoughtful about how to do that without without let's say being sacrilegious, mm -hmm. you know. B b remaining respectful to the to to the tradition to the holiness of things but also seeing it as a way to spread the seed out into the world so that so that some of these images and some of these ideas can find some uh, some 
yeah, some fertile ground out there, let's say. Well, I'm I'm so glad that you are introducing a new generation in an exciting and a, in a vivid way to Saints Christopher, Mercurius, Saints George. Um, I was delighted at every episode on Ethiopia that you did, so I really point people to that. Is there a particular place that you'd like to point my audience so that they can find all of your work? Um, and if you have any sort of uh, closing thoughts to encourage people to to produce the way you said Jordan Peterson kind of influenced you in video production, but you had all this other background in, in art that let you take off. So any budding like content creator advice as well that you could make? Yeah, well, I would say I, I um, so if you want to find my stuff, it's mostly the symbolicworld.com. You can look, you can go there and you'll find most of all I'm doing in terms of videos and you know, blogs and everything. For my carvings, it's called Pajot Carving. So my name, carvings.com. That's where that's where you find that. And in terms of advice, I would say, I mean, I think not advice, but like I think encouragement. I always want to give encouragement to to Ethiopian Christians because I think that maybe i think it, it's normal when you have something and you have this treasure that you sometimes don't know the value of because you it's just something that's in your house and it's just there and you think that it's just part of life but you know ethiopian christianity is is some has some of the most preserved coherent and powerful imagery and and uh and just thread let's say that is still alive and still glowing and so i think that to all the Ethiopian Christians that are able to do it, I think that it's it's worth putting, helping Westerners see the beauty of Ethiopian Christianity, you know, and not necessarily so they become, you know, Ethiopian Christians because that 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 might be a little hard to do, but that Ethiopian Christianity can invigorate, you know, whatever Christian tradition that they're that they're part of, and can can give them a sense of you know, like. The story you told me the last time on my podcast about the poetic tradition of Ethiopia. And I've been telling that story to everybody I meet because I just think it's one of the most amazing things I've heard in the past few years. And so I think there are many other treasures and gems there to be shared with others. So that's my encouragement. Yeah, and I had a couple of young poets who, very important, speak English to talk about that tradition on my program. Um, I think both of those were before my appearance on on your show and I definitely should invite them back to, to highlight that more and more. If I ever learn in the traditional school, I would definitely want to begin in the school of poetry myself. And so I, I appreciate that it helped to reinvigorate your Christianity and certainly your work has helped reinvigorate mine and, and that of my audience. So thank you again, Jonathan, and always welcome anytime. Yeah, it's a great joy. Thanks. Thanks, Deacon Enoch.